Morning. Morning. It's good to see you. You're looking good this fine Labor Day weekend. It's great to see you today. And I hope this Labor Day brings you joy. My name is Larry Zyman. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Community. And I am so very glad to call the St. Croix Valley. I'm so very glad to call Faith Community home. It is really a privilege to be part of it and you. Uh, a special welcome to, to those of you who joining us online. We're really, really glad you could be with us today. Hudson schools, and I know most every school fired up during this week, and you know, after like two or three grueling days, it's about time for a day off, wouldn't you think? So, so I'll be taking tomorrow off. But this is a time of year I really enjoy. It's a time uh, when family rhythms are being reestablished and the fall groove is starting to occur, and I like that time of year. Today we're going to start a new series centered on the life of a boy who becomes a man and an extraordinary leader. His name is Joseph. And one of the takeaways I hope you'll have in this series is an appreciation not only for the Joseph narrative itself, but how it fits under God's greater story and what he's doing up, what God is up to in his story, which is his story. And Joseph will be considering a family a family that had more than their share of issues, a family people might today would say they're dysfunctional, all right? Joseph and his family will display a glorious truth, and that is this. Family dysfunction need not determine one's destiny. Hear that? Family dysfunction need not determine one's destiny. As one experiences, not just tears, but experiences the good news of Jesus, it can change the destiny destinies of an individual, a family, a church, indeed a community when it grips and takes hold. Consider this family and their dysfunction. It's a family of 10 that lived in one of Chicago or one of the largest cities in America. The parents grew up during the Great Depression and they were both part of the war effort that was World War II. They married, and lived a working class existence, living from paycheck to paycheck. They sought to make their way in a world full of peril and full of promise with a house full of young kids who were trying their patience and challenged their capacity. And at one time that capacity broke where the mom had to be taken to a psychiatric facility and had to stay there for a while. She was released only because the father became worse shape than hers and she had to get out in order for the family to continue. They were at wit's end. They had their fifth child that they thought they had come to an end because they finally had a girl after four boys. Then number six came along. The psychiatric episode took, took place during the pregnancy of number seven, and they added yet another, making a total of eight. They somehow managed to see all their kids into adulthood. These children were a source of joy and a source of challenge. They, they cultivated accomplishment and pain. The offspring of these parents uh, increased their educational attainment of their families, getting PhDs and professional degrees. They met royalty and visited the poorest of the poor. They spent time living in various parts of the country and the world, large cities, small towns, all trying to make their way through life, just like all of us. Some of their marriages crashed and burned due to unforgiveness and for self-centeredness and for infidelity, leaving spouses and children and their dreams shattered, confused and hurt. Other marriages persevered and experienced joy. Alcoholism and drug abuse were mixed with solid work ethics and a desire to get ahead that led to some financial reward, some of which was lost and others that endured and grew over time. In later years, the family would never really be the same because one of the siblings would never meet together in a room that contained one of the other siblings. There were visits and arrests by law enforcement that led to humiliation, loss of dreams, and suicide. And like virtually every family tree, this family tree continues. And in case you haven't guessed it yet, we're talking about my family tree. I am number six of eight in the Zyman family, originally from the south side of Chicago, now living in Chicago, 
and Florida and Duluth and Houston and the West Coast, and here I am in Hudson. Your family tree may be healthier than mine. I certainly hope so. And if it is, I want you to know I celebrate that, and I'm grateful for that. Yours may be in rougher shape than mine. It's a distinct possibility. And I want you to know that I empathize with that and want to tell you this important thing to remind you of this, that your family's dysfunction need not determine your destiny. Your family's dysfunction need not determine your destiny. And this is especially true when you come to see your story being enfolded under God's greater story that he is crafting and weaving. We're going to be interfacing with the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. It's found in Genesis 37 through 50. And what we're going to find is not a series of propositions or principles or rules to live by. We're going to encounter a story, a narrative. And if you truly enter this story and let it enter you, you're going to have new perspective in life and you can experience change. And that's the hope to which we gather today. So our passage for today, Genesis 37, 1 through 11, it's found on page 31 in the Bibles in the chair in front of you. You can use your own Bibles, grab your mobile device. It offers a large dose of dysfunction with just a hint of hope. And we're going to find out that that's enough as the story unfolds. It points backward, reminding in the story what is already taking place as it moves forward to God's ultimate plan. And if your family is struggling right now, and I know many of our families are struggling today, if your dreams seem distant, the Bible isn't offering you seven steps to a successful family. What it offers is a grand invitation to anchor yourself and your dreams to that which will not ultimately disappoint to God himself and the story that he is crafting right now and has been for years and years and years. If you've been waning in your Bible intake, haven't opened it for a while, let me suggest this, that in the next weeks, you see if you can read Genesis 37 through 50 once a week and perhaps use the communication guide we produce each week. And I think it'll help you immerse yourself in the story and experience more of the hope that is offered here. But let's start with a little quiz to begin with. So I'm going to ask you to be bold this morning. When I ask you to raise your hand, not to do one of these things, but to get them up away. So let's start with question number one. How many of you are the youngest in your family? Raise your hand. Okay, hands back down, getting sufficiently nervous yet? Uh, how many of you would say you think in holding your position that you were treated with greater kindness than the rest of your siblings? Raise your hand. Keep them up, okay. How many of your siblings were say, would say you were treated better than they were? Okay, now the last one for the rest of you. How many of you know your youngest were treated better? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Well, what we're going to see in this narrative is something you may have gleaned from my brief history and family history, that dysfunction's nothing new. It's been around. It is. It will be there. And so with that, we turn to Genesis 37, verses 1 through 11. It reads, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that the father loved him more than all their other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, 
your sheaves gathered round it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves before, to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind, This is the word of the Lord. Well, it doesn't take world-class observational skills to recognize this is a family with issues, okay? One glaring error on the part of Jacob, the father, is his doing. He played favorites, loving Joseph more than all the other sons because he was born to him in his old age. For 17 years now, the other boys observed the youngest being valued more highly than them. Prior to May of 1980, Mount St. Helens in Washington was a glorious snow-capped mountains full of beauty and majesty. And then on the 18th, an eruption took place. The snow was gone, part of the mountain gone, the result of a volcanic uh, explosion, and it was just a volcanic mess. What, this is what's happening to Jacob's family right now. His favoritism was a volcano percolating underground and beneath the exterior of his family. And when he gave the robe of many colors to Joseph, an explicit sign of preference and celebration, it was eruption time. And verse 4 says that in response to this, his brothers hated him and could not even speak peacefully to him. Now Jacob, the father who gave the robe, he knew about alienation in the family in the family he grew up in because both of his parents played favorite. Jacob was a mama's boy, and his brother Esau was daddy's guy. Jacob and Esau, they would battle for dad's Isaac's blessing and were estranged from one another to the point that Jacob fled and feared for his life. So Jacob knew what it was like to be on the end, uh, receiving end of such hatred, and yet here he was passing this down to the next generation. Beware, folks. Sin can be passed down to the next generation. It can follow. Jacob learned to play favorites, creating an atmosphere that led to relational breakdown. And so let's pull out of the story and just pause for a moment for a little bit of uh, application here. Parents, please consider how this is playing out or not playing out in your life. One of the things you might be able to do is after you eat dinner tonight or after the kids go to bed to say, how are we doing? How are we doing in this area? And parents, oh, and let me add, grandparents, this goes for you too, all right? Now, I can understand you shouldn't treat your kids identically. We didn't. They're all so, it's weird how you can have same set of parents, same environment, kids can be so different, right? right? So you can't treat them identically. You gotta be aware of the different wiring they have, the giftings they have, the quirks that they have, and respond according to that. So you don't, you sh- don't need to treat them identically, but you should treat them fairly, all right? You should treat them fairly. And so it might be a good idea for you to have a chat about that. See how you're doing. If your kids are older in age, you you might take the step and say, what do you guys think? And be prepared for that. Could be challenging. Could be a breakthrough for your family. So, well, back to our text now. Joseph, he didn't help the relational cause at all because while he was working the flock with his siblings, he brought back a bad report to his father. So we have the younger brother tattling on the older brothers. I mean, how many of you heard your youngest sibling say, I'm going to tell mom and dad, and when I do, you're going to be in big trouble. Big trouble, I tell you. You're going to be in big trouble. You'll be so sorry. We heard that. Okay. I could hear Joseph saying, Dad, 
Judah, Benjamin, and Asher, they didn't take the sheep to the pasture you said to. I did, but, but they didn't. Right? Everyone loves a snitch, right? And you could imagine how the brothers felt about him. And then dad busts out the robe that says, this little traitor holds a favored position. Little Joseph's not endearing himself to his brothers at all. And this flew in the face also in how their culture operated. It was the norm that the firstborn son had more authority and they would have experienced more financial gain as things unfolded. As a matter of fact, there was, if, regarding inheritance, the firstborn son would receive a double inheritance, inheritance of the others. I don't know how fair that is. It's just the way things operated. It was the culture in which they lived. And yet Jacob was making it really clear that this young one was number one. He wasn't down here with the rest of them. And the other 11 hated Joseph for it. Jacob created the problem, but the punk little brother didn't help his cause at all. I mean, he compounds his tension as he has a dream, and it's very easy to interpretation that led to an instant reaction from his siblings. He got his brothers together and said, hey, hear this dream that I had. We were in the field binding sheaves, and my sheaf stood up straight, and yours gathered round it and bowed down to it. His brothers knew exactly where he was going. They replied, oh, are you indeed going to reign over us or are you going to rule over us? So daddy's little favorite not only had his affection and the robe, now this little brat is saying, and by the way, I'm going to rule over you someday. Spoiled Joseph had another dream. Very similar in nature, very easy to interpret. In this one, the sun, moon, and 11 stars now bow down to him. We're not aware if Jacob was aware of the first dream, but he might have been okay with it since his favorite son was giving the dream and it was happening to the kids, to the other brothers. But then he rebukes Joseph and said, whoa, are you saying that me and mom and your 11 siblings are all going to bow to you? And verse 11 ends in a way that's both understandable and curious. It says that the brothers were jealous of him but Jacob kept this saying in mind. It seemed that he was both offended and intrigued by what was going on before him. Now, at this point in the story, I assume most of us would feel we would want to stay clear of people like Jacob and their offspring. It was a situation dripping with ill will. Now, many of you know that Joseph turns to be quite the hero by the end of the story, an amazing leader. But what we will see is that the path from being a snot-nosed little brother to an incredible leader was not a path that was neither straight nor pain-free. Setbacks were frequent. They were refining. They were significant. But God used them to shape Joseph into a strategic and helpful leader, not only for his family, not only for the nation, but affecting us here right now today. So hear me well, current dysfunction need not disqualify you. It doesn't need to determine your destiny. A heart gripped by the gospel is a game changer. Nature and nurture, they matter, but not supremely. The Joseph narrative starts with palpable dysfunction. There's no value in denying reality, ignoring the pain that's around us. But there are greater realities then where you find yourself today that's able to eclipse both your nature and your nurture. And it's found in the gospel. This narrative offers hope. And you might ask, where do you see that in the text today? And I would say, thanks for asking. Let me show you. The final verse in our text does seem a bit odd. And every time I've read that in recent weeks, I'm reminded of Luke chapter 2, the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, where the angels come to a young mother named Mary and tell them what, I'm sorry, where the shepherds come to a young mother named Mary and tell them what the angels said to the shepherds. All right. And it says of Mary that she treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. It's almost as if she's taking the information, she's processing it for future references. Knowing the promises that were given in the past, she's receiving corroboration of them 
as, as to the certainty of God's saving plan through this baby named Jesus. Knowing the promises given to Israel in the past and to her a bit more recently, she is increasing in her certain that God's plan is unfolding. Mary is looking both backward to, to what was promised and looking at her own life, and she's looking forward to what God's going to do. She's living in active hope. She had hope. And I get the same sense when I read verse 11. I think it's fair to say Joseph is both disturbed and intrigued by what's going on in front of him in this disturbed that the arrogance of his young son, including the culturally offensive thought that the father and the mother were to bow down before them when he was supposed to honor his mother and father. But he was intrigued, too, because this exchange didn't take place in a vacuum. Look at verses 1 and 2 of our text. It said that Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan, and this is the generations of Jacob. So verse 1 establishes the location of what's going on here, the land of Canaan. He refers it to the land of his sojourning, Jacob's sojourning, or his wanderings. Right? So who is the father of Jacob, and why does that matter? His name is Isaac. And who is the name of Isaac's father, and why does that matter? Well, his name was Abraham. And Larry, why are we having this little ancestry moment together? Hang with me, you'll see. What we're going to see is that God's saving plan in Christ, including us here in America in 2022, had its verbal unveiling in a man named Abraham. Abraham was given the promise that all the nations on earth would be blessed by him and his family, which did not come about, however, till he was about 100 years old, and his wife was well past bearing age, and they had a child and named him Isaac. Abraham's demonstrated faith in God multiple times, and God said he would keep the promise through his son Isaac because of Abraham's faith. In chapter 26, God appears to Isaac and tells him he would give him the land and his offspring and that all the nations would be blessed through him because of Abraham's obedience to God. So the promise was given to Abraham. The same promise was given to Isaac. And then he blesses, that is, Isaac blesses Jacob and says, your offspring will be like the dust of the earth in Genesis 28. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And you and in you and your offspring, all the nations, all the families on earth will be blessed. So this covenantal promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is made. In a number of times, both God and others referred to God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was his code language. They were saying, hey, I'm the covenant-keeping God. I'm the one you heard about. I am the real deal. I can be trusted. Jacob had an encounter with God, and his name was changed to Israel. Okay, so now we're back to our text where we read that Jacob was living in the land of his father, who was Isaac. The promise is moving forward. This points out now to the generations of Jacob or Israel, and given their commitment to the oldest first, it's strange that the promise that we say these are the generations of Jacob, and the first one mentioned is Joseph. You'd expect that the promise would be passed to the firstborn son, born son, but we're hearing this all through the lens, through the lens of this younger son. Now, Israel hears this son say, Dad, you and Mom and all the brothers, you're going to bow down to me. So this not only flies in the face of their culture, but the high commitment of honoring your father and mother that Scripture calls to and so Jacob's, I'm sorry, Joseph's second dream is especially problematic. Yet after rebuking him, it says he kept the saying in mind. Why? Because of the promise. It was somewhere back in the operating system of his mind and dots were being connected. And here lies the hope. Even with all the dysfunction of Jacob's clan, 
And Abraham and Isaac, they had their issues as well, okay? But even with all the dysfunction, there was still a promise given by a faithful God. Dysfunction does not disqualify people walking in biblical hope, not by a long shot. And as we begin a series centered on the person of Joseph, we're going to find that ultimately this covenant, this promise, it's not about Joseph at all. It's about God. It's about God and his fulfilling the promises he made to bless all the nations way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's offspring. And because of God's divine activity, through his flawed image bearers, we have been blessed today through Abraham and his offspring. And through us people of faith community, flawed image bearers that we are, God is blessing Papua New Guinea, Uganda, Ethiopia, Central Asia, Turkey, and Thailand, and India. All those nations. God is blessing peoples from the nations going to UWRF through the All Nations House that is taking place. God is blessing people from the nations that go to Jonathan House in St. Paul where Sarah Holstein runs it and she'll be with us here next week. God is blessing the largest immigrant population group in the Twin Cities through Zach and Angie Zyman who are serving people there and they'll be with us here the week after Sarah Holstein. The story continues. The dream is being realized because God is the author of it all. It's not about us. Dysfunction does not determine destiny. Nature or nurture will not make the final call. God will. He makes the call. And one of the many things that we'll learn as we continue through the story of Joseph is of God's providence, that his, of his rulership or over all the affairs of man, no matter how inane and insane they are, God's story will and is marching along. Through all the ups and downs of life, God is honoring the promise he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Joseph, right down through us here, as part of the story of story, the unfolding of God's glory through his son who lived, died, and rose again, and who said before Abraham was, I am. For whatever reason, and I don't pretend to know this, God has chosen to execute his plan through flawed people. So when we have dreams, even God-given dreams, they will always contain some distortion as they filter through the likes of us. And as we have seen in Joseph's story, the path to fulfillment can be really, really difficult. If you're a young person here today, you may believe that God has given you a dream that will really impact others. When you encounter an obstacle, don't stop. Keep on. Don't stop. Don't abandon it. God may be refining you so that you have the character and the capacity needed for when he takes you to that new place. The process of refinement will lead to all sorts of thorny issues of the heart. For instance, what's the difference between personal ambition and a godly dream. I've gotten those confused in the past when it meets with my twisted heart. And here's the kicker. I am still waiting for my first pure motive. I'm being serious here. Right? Even at my best, I'm less than what I could or should be. I'm waiting for my first pure motive. So any dream I have if it's not submitted to God, if it's not brought, God's people aren't brought into it as we wrestle with it, I am destined for something really spooky. But when I bring God and his people into the mix, it sees that God has a way of bringing it to a better place, a better place. Not through a perfect life, but as we offer ourselves daily, as flawed human beings that we are, or as we say about our children and as we dedicate them, surrendering all worldly claim upon our lives that we might belong wholly to him. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I am not a dreamer, which is really crazy that I'm kicking off a series on dreaming, on the dreamer. But, one, you know, there's some people who like to go up and live their life swinging for the fence. 
That's not me. My goal was to get a stand-up double and not pull my hamstring, all right? That, that's like me going, wow, all right? Especially with my foot speed. All right, so anyway, this is what happens with the dreams. I'm not much of a dreamer, but I did feel like God at one time gave me a dream. And that was that I would give my life to the ministry calling I thought he had, and what God would do through me would be to affect six family trees. Now, for many of you, you think, that's it? That was for me. So I said, I give my life to that, to affect six family trees. Okay. And that was part of it. I told Carol, my wife, we talked about it. I've told people through the years, this is what I thought. And some would give me in, input as to how they thought I was doing. But most would say that's not much of a dream. But it seemed worthy to me as a guy who likes to stand up double without a pulled hamstring. Well, many of you know that I've spent a fair amount of time in Uganda in recent years, most recently wrapping up a cohort of training pastors in May. And as we were preparing for the graduation ceremony, Chris Mobs, our key contact on the ground and who runs the training center in Uganda, we were talking about the 36 graduates that took place. And one of the things he pointed out, he said, do you realize that these 36 people represent six different people groups with distinction, distinctive culture and language. Then it struck me. My dreams were Larry Zyman's size, but God's plans and purposes were not. The thought that came to my mind, six families were filtered through my flawed, fearful, unbelieving heart, which I still wrestle with today. What God brought about that I didn't even recognize until it was over, so it just shows how much faith this guy has, was exceedingly abundant above all I ever asked or thought. And there are now pastors serving, there were some who served earlier today, in six different people groups because of the promise given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob ran right through Joseph and his dysfunctional family, right into my life and my dysfunctional family, right through your lives and dysfunctional families because you helped make this all happen. And there are affected because why? The God of hope has entered into the story. This is about his story and what he's up to. And I hope you'll continue with us as we go through the story in the Joseph, with Joseph in the weeks ahead because it points to a greater story. And in this story of stories, another favored son is highlighted, but he behaves differently. This favored son commits himself and gives his life for the brothers that they might live. His name is Jesus. And the place is in Jesus is a place where every valid dream will be fulfilled and is fulfilled. And this morning I commend him to you as a source of life. Ultimately, godly dreams are not about us. They're about God. It's about him purposing our lives and filling them with meaning. And as we walk together, let's give ourselves to this God. Let's give ourselves to the God who is providentially moving all history to the point where dreams will not be needed anymore, where faith will be sight. In the end, your story, my story, will be engulfed by the story written by God, ending in a place where there'll be no more crying, nor pain, or suffering, or tears anymore, for those things will have passed away. That's where it's heading. And that is a worthy dream. Let's walk together in it. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for inviting us not merely to inhabit this earth, not merely to breathe air or bear your image, but to participate in your purposes that you are committed to bringing about, that you have been unfolding for millennia, beginning with Abraham and before as we consider the life of Joseph together, point us to the better brother. Point us to Jesus that he may make of us a people that may honor you, that he would make of us a people who would build up one another, that he would make of us a type of people who love their enemy and so display your glory. Your purposes are that great. 
and we want to participate and ask that you take us there in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand with me and let's respond.